It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 358 of Science on Top. This is Thursday, the 14th of May, 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi, Ed. And we're here talking to you about science because some very wonderful people have signed up on Patreon and donated for each episode. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate to help us out. You only get charged when we release an episode and you can put a limit on how much you donate per month. We're very, very grateful to all those people who have chipped in. Now, Lucas, do you remember one of the first times when we had Dr. Crystal Evans on the show and we were talking about her work trying to eradicate malaria? I do. Basically, the conversation, as I remember it, went like this. The parasite gets into the liver. Okay, can we kill it there? Well, yes, but by then it's moved into the heart. Okay, can we kill it there? Maybe, but before long it's in the lung capillaries. And then, no, it's in the bloodstream. And so on. And it's one of these really cunning uh, parasites that just transforms itself, moves about really, really skillfully and is able to avoid all our defences and most of the things we throw at it. But now a team uh, in Kenya and the UK have been trialling a fungal infection for mosquitoes that looks really promising at uh, eradicating the parasite from them and therefore from humans, which is exciting. Yeah, and as you say, the the conversation with with Dr Crystal back then was like, well, there's not much good news here. And that was kind of part of the, one of the reasons why there's so many people investigating uh, malaria and, and potential cures for malaria. And malaria kills just extraordinary numbers of people every year. Um, in, t- in 2018, the World Health Organization estimate of 228 million cases um, of malaria and over 405,000 deaths. So when you consider the deaths from COVID-19 are up around the 280-something mm. thousand now, I think, globally, um, as we're recording this, malaria you know, does more than this every yeah. single year. Of course, it mainly kills poor people. So, you know, this is, uh, it doesn't get the headlines that and COVID's got and it doesn't cause lockdowns and whatever because being a mosquito-borne disease, it's very, very prominent in the tropical regions. <laughs> stay, stay inside doesn't help. Yeah. But also I think it's important to note that of those uh, 405,000 people a year that it kills, most of them are kids under the age of five as well, which makes this even more kind of a yeah. pressing need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So over the years there's been, you know, there's been various approaches, but the, the most common, you know, the stock standard approach to, to malaria is, is more about prevention. It's mosquito nets when you're sleeping. It, it's that sort of approach to things. Um, now there've been we've done some malaria stories on the podcast over the years. We've we've talked about some potential ways of controlling the mosquito populations over the years. One of them, from memory, I can't remember who was involved when we covered it or really what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one! That was great. <laughs> I do remember. I do remember talking to someone somewhere about um, a one control mechanism that sort of wipes out the males in mosquitoes, which then, of course, will drive down the mosquito population. That would have been Dr. Cameron Webb. It probably was. So anyway, um, there's there's lots of different approaches that have been thrown around. Now, this is interesting, and it's not completely new, unique because there are a couple of other potential candidates for controlling malaria in a very similar fashion. But a, uh, a team who were looking at this spore-forming single-celled microbe, uh, which, is, which is called Microsporidia MB, they've found that this, this microbe, which, which is actually endemic in some mosquitoes in Kenya, it, it has the, uh, the characteristic that it actually stops the infection of the uh, Plasmodium uh, falciparum, which is this parasitic you know, protozoan that causes the, uh, the infection. It stops it from taking root inside the mosquito host. So they have even found that if they infect, and, and infect isn't even the right word really here we're talking about, if they put this microbe into mosquitoes, and then it then deliberately expose those mosquitoes to infected blood, so blood that has this Plasmodium falciparum protozoan inside it. 
they it's a very low rate of infection then in those mosquitoes not zero very low but they have not observed any of these mosquitoes starting to uh to multiply the the harmful bores in them that would normally be the case once they picked up that protozoan so basically it's almost like it it makes them whilst not completely immune to picking up the thing that causes malaria they don't seem to then turn on the factories inside their bodies, which then cause what infects the humans, which is really cool. Now, one of the considerations, of course, with anything like this is if you start messing around with any ecosystem, what are the potential downsides? Now, as far as they can tell, mos mosquitoes that are carrying this Microspiridia MB don't seem to exhibit any other problems, symptoms, whatever at all. It doesn't affect them in any other way. It doesn't reduce their lifespan. It doesn't seem to reduce their reproductivity. It doesn't seem to have any other impact on the mosquitoes. And additionally, it is passed on maternally. So it's passed on through the maternal line. So if you get enough of this into the population, it will then sustain itself because once it's in a line, it stays there, which is really cool. So it's, it's almost like we can replace the, you know, the placeholder where the malaria protozoan would, would lodge itself in the mosquito. We can put something there already so that that doesn't happen. And then the mothers will pass it on to their children in future. Now, thus far, it's only been found in a particular species of mosquito. So there's not, it's not known yet whether this will work with other species of mosquito. And there are several species of mosquito that um, can transmit malaria. It is also not known yet, you know, what other effects it might have on the rest of the ecosystem. So it doesn't harm the mosquito. It doesn't drive the mosquito numbers down. Although that's a whole nother thing. I actually went down a rabbit hole when I was reading about this because there's a whole, um, there's a whole debate as to whether reducing mosquito numbers would even have an impact on anything else because mosquitoes are in such huge, huge numbers. Um, but displacing them doesn't seem to mean that food sources collapse for other, for other species and other, you know, other animals and so forth. So that was interesting, but that's a sort of a side note. Yeah, but it's something that I've always wondered because you know, obviously mosquitoes spread so many diseases and things, and it would be yeah. great if we, yeah. and they're annoying, let's face it. If we did eradicate them, what would be the on-flowing effects of that? And the only thing I can think of that it would maybe be a problem would be for your micro bats and things like that. that eat. Right. But if that's, if we completely... Yeah. Uh, eradicate them so yes. I don't know yeah and that's why I say it was an interesting rabbit hole to go down reading you know scientists debating with each other in forums and um, in responses to published papers are some of the things that I ended up <laughs> ended up you know trying to digest um, that that there's a there's a real there's not a consensus on on whether you know even completely eradicating mosquitoes would actually impact the eco or any given ecosystem at all. And I found that really surprising, given you know as I say the sheer numbers of mosquitoes that you would assume they have some role in the you know in the ecosystem from a you know, as a food source and so forth. So there, I did mention there are other candidates for controlling things within mosquitoes in a similar way. This is the only one so far for malaria. There are a couple of others. There's, a, there's one called Wolbachia, which is a, a, a type of bacteria that also naturally occurs in, in populations. And that seems to have a very similar effect in preventing dengue, so dengue fever, from getting into, you know, the bacteria that cause dengue from getting into the mosquito populations. So there's concurrent studies looking at that and looking at, what, you know, potentially wiping out dengue with, uh, with a similar approach with a completely different bacteria. So, uh, and there was another one that I, I read about that I've, I've since lost where I'd highlighted that one so I can't remember what it was but yeah very very interesting and and um given the the overall sense of of um hopelessness uh, as you kind of mentioned in your mm. in your uh, intro uh this sounds like a real uh, a really promising uh lead into to other ways which because it doesn't cause any harm to the mosquito we potentially don't even have the issue of you know that cascade effect of introducing things into into populations and it's already there like we should point out it's already in something like 10 percent of the mosquitoes over there anyway so it's already endemic in the population the next stage, they need to do more studies. They're going to do these semi-field studies, which are in these controlled uh, environments that are effectively outdoors, but they're sealed. So I kind of, I picture like something like a massive greenhouse with mosquito nets on them, keeping them in rather than keeping them out. Biodome. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what will happen next, just to really see the how well it does spread through populations and what controls need to be in place. So that's, that's what they'll be looking at uh, next in this particular study. 
But yeah, very cool. It's very cool, very exciting. But I mean, maybe it's just because I'm a bitter and twisted old man. There's a part of me that thinks this is too good to be true. Like, and what's the uh, downside? What's it going? To, I, the flow-on effect going to be? <laughs> but. Yeah, I know. And and like any time, Australia, for example, hasn't got a great track record in introducing some life form to control another life form. Cane toads. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, cane toads. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's others as well. You know, we've had issues with that before. So, so really, this is why these control studies are important. But that whole cane toad thing, man, that just gets me every time. So, what? Fancy introducing a creature that you think is going to feed on something that lives on the other end of the cane that the toads can't get to. I just, I can't. I just don't understand what the thought process was there. But anyway, well, that's a, that's another rabbit hole. Yes, and uh, different time, different knowledge base. Yeah, but it's somewhat relevant to our next story which is one that we absolutely have to talk about penny uh it's critical science (laughs) it's a sad story uh but i fear one that (laughs) it's a roller coaster story it's one that may be somewhat prophetic if my love affair with cheese gets any more serious (laughs) do you want to tell us about the constipated northern curly-tailed lizard that was quite literally full of it. I think I I have to read the headline and the little thing from Smithsonian Mag. Super constipated Florida lizard breaks records with gargantuan poop. It has to be from Florida, doesn't it? Yeah, Florida lizard. (laughs) It has to be. There's that whole... It's like Florida man. Florida man thing. So this is Florida lizard. I was just like, oh, my God. You could not make this up. The only thing is it's like area lizard as if it was the <laughs> onion. But anyway, <laughs> so, look, the reason that this story got published, I think, is because it is a record-breaking poop, and I'm going to keep that's going to be the, the surprise at the end of the story. So this is a cur- curly-tailed li- lizard that was found near a pizza shop in Florida, and when it was picked up, um, the people who picked it up thought it was pregnant. It was so big. So it was living near a pizza shop. It was eating pizza grease or she was eating pizza grease and sand. And basically, instead of being full of eggs, she was full of poo. So the poor little thing had 22 grams of poo in it which doesn't sound like much, but that's because considering the size of these lizards, that is a... It's a three-gram lizard. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but... No, sorry. <laughs> it's a third of the pet creature's entire body volume. It's 80% of its weight. I mean, that is that is very impressive. That's a lot of... That is like... That's a lot of <laughs> insane amount. Now I don't know if anyone here has ever weighed themselves before and after, but if you lost eighty percent of your body <laughs> weight in one poo, oh my goodness! I'd feel so much better. <laughs> That would be a relief. Yeah. So the um, poor old lizard, how do I put this? Yeah. Didn't have a good ending because it's an introduced species. It's not native to that area. Uh, the lizards never really make it out alive because I, I have to confess I clicked on it hoping for some feel-good story about how, you know, they were able to get the poo out or something. and Syringe it out the butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, it got out by dissection after a very humane euthanasia. And um, it's a record breaker. <laughs> it's probably... Guinness Book of Records. Guinness Book of Records, <laughs> scientific record. I predict Ig Nobel, I reckon. Um, Maybe. You never know. Maybe. At some point. But um, I predict... Well, I think every second episode we've done this year has gone, that's probably an Ig Nobel. <laughs> I think these are the ones that, like, I gravitate to, the ones that make you think, yeah. as they say. Yeah. But, yeah, so this poor old lizard, the researchers said they hope for the animal's sake that no other animal can even approach this record. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because didn't they, they sort of, they gave it a CT scan and found that, like, there was this tiny little space for all its internal organs, the heart, the lungs, the liver. Yeah, all its other organs were, like, squished up and... Just this big poo. And the rest is just poop. (laughs) Poor old thing. Yeah, this is why we need a high-fibre diet. People, eat your veggies. Yeah, don't just eat pizza grease and (laughs) sand and insects. Which I think is probably sound advice anyway, but and in in a um in a strange segue, these lizards were actually introduced to Florida in Mm -hmm. the early forties to combat sugarcane pests. Mm. Yeah. It's just one day we'll get it right. One day we'll get rid of that sugarcane pest. Yeah. <laughs> By just introducing enough amphibians, <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> 
Well, Lucas, a few weeks ago we were talking about the idea of solar power at night and there was a promising new type of photovoltaic cell. Well, in just the last month there have been three records broken in solar power efficiency. Do you want to tell us about this? Yeah, so what do you reckon the, the current sort of um, standard solar panel efficiency is? What, what do you reckon? What sort of percentage do you reckon it, it is? Ed, what do you think? I th- it's really low. It's like 5% or something, isn't it? Penny, what do you reckon? 10. Oh, Penny's a little closer. So, th- so the, the best solar panels out there right now, commercially available solar panels, are in the low 20s. Okay. About from 20 to 23-ish percent is about the, the efficiency rating for, for solar panels. So that's obviously the efficiency rating is how much energy actually hits them versus how much they convert into usable energy. So uh, as you mentioned, three records uh, fell one after the other uh, over the last um, month or so, which is <laughs> really cool. I'm going to work my way backwards through these. I'll start with the lowest uh, efficiency. So one of them was uh, was broken using a type of technology which which has multiple layers. They've got basically two different semiconductors, one for visible parts of the light spectrum and one for infrared light. It's called a tandem cell. Uh, some German engineers created a new kind of this tandem cell uh, made from stacked silicon and, and uh, some other materials that reached around 24.16%. So that's better than anything out there right now that's a proven technology. So that's pretty cool. There were some other things about this this new technology that, that also made it very interesting. It's extremely lightweight. It's also stable. It doesn't break down. And it, it could be suitable for all sorts of coatings, which is cool, including with satellites and so forth, because oh. it's not affected by irradiation, which is, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, So that was the first one that fell. Then, not long after that, another one came along. And this was a a type of cell that uses um, junctions. And this one is about three times thinner than a hair off your head, each of the layers. It's made up of about 140 layers of this uh, this material. And this one reached up to 39.2% efficiency. Wow. So that's a, a massive step. Like we, we've almost doubled the efficiency uh, from the current solar cells out there. But the same team actually upped themselves because they further modified that uh, technology using once again this, this sort of this six junction solar cell. And with this one, with the addition of uh, focusing light, Basically, they, they have like a, a whole lot of uh, mirrors at, in, a, in, in like a semicircle around a tower. And those mirrors are all used to obviously they, they tilt the mirrors to focus the sun that's hitting the mirrors onto a single point. And often that single point is a, it's called a collector. And that collector basically focuses uh, and, and harvests the heat that's collected from those mirrors from all of this focused light. And it, it basically heats water. It's a steam engine. Right. Um, so, so they did a similar thing. They used mirrors to, to focus uh, more light onto the, the uh, collection area. And with that one, they managed to achieve uh, 40, um, 47.1% efficiency wow. for the uh, solar cell. That's normal, almost 50%. Which is... That's... Yeah, yeah. Way more than... So that's obviously... The, that's, that is now the most efficient in the world of, of any that have been tested and published. And, uh, and, and as I say, it beat the previous world record holder by a couple of weeks, <laughs> uh, which was thankfully by the same team. But even without, even without the concentrated light, it's still, um, it's still a fairly high number. But yeah, it was, it was still uh, significantly more efficient than existing, uh, existing panels out there. So we've we've talked about, and the reason I jump on these stories, we I, I like uh, I follow battery technology stuff and also solar cells because one thing that I've read a lot during the COVID nineteen crisis is that that there's obviously been an unprecedented shift in energy usage. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's led to uh, quite a few uh, countries basically having problems where they're producing too much power with their coal power stations. And other countries are like, well, we're, we're OK, we're, we're using um, renewables. And they've been able to actually run whole cities off renewables without using fossil fuels at all. So, so there's been a lot of call politically to, to make the recovery, the economic recovery out of COVID-19, uh, very much focused on uh, a renewable future. And let, let's let's use let's use that to stimulate economies by you know by building and developing new technologies and so forth so this is really timely uh, because obviously you know solar is just one of the renewables out there that we need to utilize but but this uh, low efficiency rating has long been a problem with solar 
But to make such significant steps forward in a very short time uh, after many, many years of low, low, um, you know, quite low numbers is, is really exciting. That's very cool. Yeah. And let's hope that we do see that push towards renewables yeah. as yeah. Uh, we recover from the COVID-19 crisis. And storage. I, I, there's another story that mm. was a couple of week, weeks ago about a new, new ways of um, storing hydrogen because hydrogen cells have long been a, a utopia uh, idea, particularly for car manufacturers, for storing energy with cars. But um, uh, the technology is just not there yet. But there was uh, some, some new novel um, uh, studies that were coming out showing some other potential technologies technologies for storing hydrogen um, and energy within hydrogen, which would be uh, really, really good for, uh, for, you know, for electric cars and so forth, electric car uh, battery cells. So I'll follow that. And if more comes up, I shall certainly share it. Excellent. Exciting stuff. And I think that's our show. As usual, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 358. And if you go to scienceontop.com slash donate, you can help us make the show by contributing on Patreon. Thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. 